Hello all, today I'm going to demonstrate the process by which I soldered this custom keyboard PCB using Reflow. The design is based on the popular TGR Alice by Uxi, but leverages a daughter board in place of a more typical USB connector along with KL hot swap sockets. While I don't intend for this video to be a complete how-to, it should at least give you a sense of what to expect if you'd like to take on such a project for yourself. I'll include a list of some of the components I used along with some general recommendations in the description. Let's go ahead and get started. To begin with, here are a couple shots showing a bare PCB fresh from JLC. I tried my hand at some minimal board art using exposed copper, but otherwise left things fairly standard with a green solder mask. At the time, alternate colors cost extra, but I think JLC has since begun offering them for no additional charge. Typically, you can choose whether or not to have the SMT or surface mount technology components pre-soldered with the help of systems commonly known as pick and place machines. During the ordering phase, I wasn't at all familiar with JLC's requirements for SMT assembly, so I just decided to take on reflow myself. Regardless, KL hot swap sockets are decently niche, and I don't expect most fabs to have them in stock. Unless, of course, you have that Rama connection. With a bill of materials in hand, we can work on sourcing components for our build. Prior to filming, I had already purchased all of the required electrical pieces and sockets from DigiKey and KBD fans, respectively. I also went ahead and picked up several Wentai SMT boxes from Adafruit alongside the USB-C daughter boards they stock. From there, I pre-labeled boxes for the controllers, wires, SMD switches, daughter boards, resistors, capacitors, headers, crystals, and diodes. I can't recommend doing this enough for soldering projects overall, especially if you'll be working with a large number of components with smaller footprints, variable resistance and capacitance, or both. Moving on, we can start breaking down our orders from DigiKey and KBD fans. For ease of handling and quantity tracking, SMT components usually come in long reels of sealed plastic, the top of which can be peeled away for access. Here, I'm placing the KL hot swap sockets into the Wentai organizers I mentioned earlier. As you'll see later in the video, the other components are much smaller and were difficult to capture on film reliably, but I promise they involve more or less the same action. Simply peel and empty each reel into the pre-labeled boxes. Now, let's talk about the stencil fixture. The stencil is a large sheet of aluminum that was ordered alongside the boards and has holes that correspond with the SMT pads of the PCB. The setup I have on camera is comprised of two spare PCBs oriented square to one another and then taped to the aluminum stencil. This creates a corner for aligning the target boards along with an impromptu hinge to lift the sheet once solder application is complete. As an aside, do be careful when handling the stencil as the edges will most likely be untreated and sharp. With the fixture in place, we can move on to making sure our stencil and target board are free from dust and remnant solder paste. This isn't required if you're starting off with an entirely fresh sheet, but at the time of filming, I had already made a few boards with the fixture. Here, I'm using some isopropyl alcohol, followed by Q-tips and compressed air to get things as clean as possible. If you intend on doing multiple rounds of boards across time, do make sure to clean after each batch to prevent any excess paste from hardening and blocking the holes. With the stencil prepared, we can move on to the actual application of the solder paste. Using the fixture, I place the target board into the corner created by the two spares and close the sheet on top of it. From there, I make sure that the holes are properly aligned and that I cannot see the green solder mask. Paste application is typically done with wide plastic spatulas, specifically made for use with stencils, but I just have a cheap one I picked up from a local hardware store that seemed flexible enough. Once you've got a good amount of paste on your spatula, proceed to hold the tool at an angle and force the viscous medium through all of the holes within the stencil. I found that between 30 and 45 degrees was optimal for application and separately that between 60 and 90 degrees was useful for gathering up any remaining paste. Real talk, I understand that my application technique is by no means professional, but I'm a hobbyist and this was maybe my second or third time using solder paste. Once finished, I grab a magnifying glass that's far too small and verify that I've successfully gotten paste onto all exposed SMT pads. For less extensive projects, visual inspection at application time would probably suffice, but I had 152 components and wasn't about to risk starting over a few hours into placement. I determine that it looks good and move on to the surgeon replay section of this process. All right, let's start with the main controller assembly. Like most PCBs in the hobby, I opted for an Atmega 32U4, specifically the AU variant in a 44 TQFP package. 
Here, I was trying to achieve an overhead shot reminiscent of some popular keyboard streamers that found it difficult to get alignment perfect without leaning into the board. Sorry for my head ahead of time. Once I get the controller squared away, I move on to the JST header that will ultimately connect to the daughter board with a USB port. Most popular gasket style boards with tight tolerances use such a configuration to limit plate rigidity as well as strain on the USB connector. Switching angles, you can see that I've moved on to placing the resistors, SMD reset switch, capacitors, and crystal. The capacitors are oriented around the controller, and the crystal is to the bottom left of it. The former store charge to account for any power fluctuations from VCC, or the power supply pin of the USB connection, while the latter serves as a clock for the integrated circuit. I am definitely not an electrical engineer though, and this is just my understanding after spending a month designing the board. Outside of the shot, I have my laptop open to my schematic in Eagle to verify placement since my resistors and capacitors vary in resistance and capacitance, respectively. I've left this part minimally edited to give you a sense of how slow I was at placing components overall. Again, I grab my magnifying glass and check that I managed to align the components adequately enough for a reflow to occur. With the driver components in place, we can move on to the diodes. Diodes are electrical components that, for the most part, only conduct current in one direction within a specified voltage range. In keyboards, they are typically paired with switches to prevent ghosting and bolster signal reliability across matrices. Here, I'm using standard 1N4148s that come in a tiny SOD 123 package. This is by far the most difficult portion of the assembly since the diodes are easily moved out of position and the line denoting the negative end or cathode on this batch was very faint. If you're going to do this yourself, opt for a through hole variety of diodes within your design and just solder them alongside your mechanical switches. If you're eagle eyed, pun intended, this design indeed does not have an SMT component for protection against ESD or electric static discharge. ESD units are an array of reverse diodes that route any excess voltage from VCC and the I.O. pins to ground via punch through when the voltage present in the integrated circuit exceeds a threshold. Incorporating one into a PCB design involves connecting the aforementioned routes to individual pins on the ESD component. Moving forward, I definitely intend on having all of my boards protected, even though some people feel it is unnecessary in such low voltage circuits. Anyways, back to the action on screen. I eventually managed to get all 66 of the switch diodes placed. After struggling with the diodes, the size of the Kale hot swap sockets is basically a godsend. These components enable solderless mechanical switch installation and were included in the design as a proof of concept. As was the case with the diodes earlier, I probably will opt for regular old through hole pads for future designs since the sockets are pretty finicky and take a long time to reflow by hand given their large footprint. Furthermore, SMT pads aren't really intended to handle perpendicular force, and a lot of cheaper hot swap boards end up having them lifted when pressure is applied from switch pins. To prevent this and ensure that the resultant connections are strong, I go back and apply a bit of pressure to all of the sockets a few times. Now that we have our components in position, it's time to move on to soldering. When people think of soldering, they typically imagine the aptly named soldering iron. However, most industrial PCB assembly services use a process known as reflow to heat solder paste based on a specific temperature curve known as a reflow profile with a specified reflow zone or range in which the highest temperature is reached. It is in this range that the paste transitions into a molten state and adheres SMT components to the respective pads. As you saw earlier, I'm using a cheap hot air gun that blatantly rips off the HACO coloring scheme set to around 325 degrees Celsius. While reflow is typically achieved between 240 and 250 degrees Celsius within an enclosed oven, pointed hot air doesn't hold temperature particularly well, especially not in an apartment that is perpetually below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. As you might expect, this process takes a long time since only a small portion of the board is being targeted at once. I try to be gradual with how I'm applying heat by shifting the tool back and forth, but eventually get tired and blast the diodes and hot swap sockets. In the future, I would like to reapproach reflow using either a temperature controlled skillet or hot air oven, but sadly, I don't have either at the moment. Visually speaking, reflow is pretty satisfying. 
As the solder paste approaches the reflow zone, it transitions from a matte, dull gray to a brilliant, shiny silver most are familiar with seeing on PCBs. Additionally, a useful benefit of reflow is its ability to align SMT components as the result of surface tension. Solder mask, where the green layer covering most of the board's copper, is comprised of a specific polymer that prevents solder bridges or connections that are not intended within a circuit, contributing to this alignment. If you get a chance, I'd highly recommend checking out some videos on YouTube to get a much better sense of this action than I've been able to capture here. As was the case with my solder application, I know my attempt at reflow probably doesn't meet manufacturing specifications, but at the end of the day, the board seems to work well and has been going strong as my daily driver for nearly a year. Quick note, when working with components with larger footprints, it doesn't hurt to push down slightly with tweezers while applying heat to ensure the leads are making good contact with the board. I had a couple of signal issues in my first build that were fixed by a subsequent round of heating and a bit of pressure on the JST header. Here, I'm inspecting the board's pads to verify that all have reflowed properly and that there are no bridges between SMT leads or controller pins. An easy way to do the former is to look out for any connections that don't shine when angled toward a light source. In the event that you do encounter a bridge, I would recommend reheating the area prior to taking a very thin piece of metal and running it between the shorted pads or pins. I had to do this once on my controller, but don't believe I caught it on film. You could also try just reheating the pads in question, but in my case, I simply had an excess amount of solder that surface tension couldn't rectify, and that had to be removed. Once complete, you can additionally check that all of the components remain in place when touched lightly. Be careful, though, as the board will most likely be hot for quite some time after reflow is complete. Moving on, we can now ready our daughter board to connect to our JST header. This is fairly straightforward and represents a more typical soldering approach using an iron. First, I cut a four lead jumper cable before exposing the interior wires using a cable stripper. Afterwards, I twist the wires to limit fraying and ensure the resultant solder joints make good contact. You can also apply a bit of solder to each of the wires at this point if you feel like being especially diligent. Here, I'm making labels that correspond to the necessary data plus, data minus, VCC, and ground connections on the breakout board before proceeding to apply them to each of the four wires based on my design. From there, I apply solder to the pads that correspond to our four wires. Again, data plus, data minus, VCC, labeled VBUS on the board, and ground. For neatness, I braid the cable, but overall, don't think it's especially necessary. When it comes time to solder, simply heat each of the pads and push the corresponding wires to join. This is where having the wires labeled comes in handy. I follow up with a bit of heat shrink to make the wire more secure. There you have it. Once you've gotten your PCB and daughter board soldered, you can move on to flashing the assembly with your favorite firmware and installing it into your case. I'll keep the purview of this video limited to SMT placement and reflow, but do let me know in the comments if you guys are interested in how I built these stacked acrylic cases or designed the PCB itself. Also, consider subscribing if you like the content and would like to see more DIY videos tied to the mechanical keyboard hobby. Thanks for watching and have a great day.